Okay. Uh, the only thing is, ah, okay. So um, we've uh, finished with signals, I was saying, and the word I, I should have said more is environmental signals. And that's in the paper by Jerome Mack and Paola. And I think it's a very, very good uh, term to describe, to describe all of those forces acting on the system and also within the system. They create changes, modifications, perturbations that are then that then have an influence or not, but that might express themselves as a change of grain size, a change of water discharge, a change of depositional environment, whatever, but they may have a stratigraphic expression recorded in the sediments. And therefore we, we try to be able to interpret this. And environmental signal I like because the environment, you may have a greenish view, let's say, of the environment uh, or ecology. That's, that's maybe the, the term we use at the moment uh, to be an environmentalist uh, is to kind of care for the environment. But it's not just that. The environment is everything around us etymologically. Okay. And so environmental signals, tectonics, for instance, belongs to the environment. Uh, climate, of course, belongs to the environment. Uh, so everything around us, volcanoes, uh, they create environmental signals. So, so, so the environment, if you care about the environment, the environment is a, is a, is a, is a very broad thing. It's everything around us, okay? And it's everything around the sedimentary system. So eustasy, eustatic cycles are environmental signals. Now, uh, now we can, after this non-exhaustive view of signals, uh, we, we start the chapter and that's the, the finishing chapter. And I would rather have more time uh, to do this, but uh, that's like this. Maybe I will finish by myself. Uh, if we don't finish today, then I will send you an extra video. Um, we we uh, we start the, the this chapter because we've seen that uh, there is signals and they propagate, and so how can we address this uh, this topic this question? And I like to start uh, for this presentation with these two important concepts that uh, you already heard a lot about in this uh, in this course. Uh, the concept of a sedimentary system that goes from source to sink and the concept of response time that we haven't dealt with too much yet. Oh, excuse me. Um, and the sedimentary system, I just wanted to show you instead of the classical uh, side view, a view of a real image, a real natural sedimentary system of the world. And this is the this is the Gange Brahmaputra system with the Himalayas seen from space, from the shuttle, I think. You have the Himalayas with the Tibetan plateau. You see the arid Tibetan plateau, some lakes maybe. The highest peaks of the Himalayas. We are some of those peaks. Uh, maybe some of these. Maybe this is the Everest. I'm not sure, but some of these are, are eight thousand meter. So it's really big, big, big mountain. Uh, and then some uh, drainage systems draining this. And then a big river. I mean, a river that you see from the space, uh, from space is a big river. And this is the, the Brahmaputra. The Brahmaputra actually uh, is already running somewhere here behind in the Himalayas, behind the Himalayas on the Tibetan plateau. Maybe it's here, or maybe it's here. And it goes and turns around. And it's probably this here. Turns around here and then goes here and comes down there. And then it runs along the Himalaya and collect many, many rivers that are all big, OK? Including the Gange coming here. And they form a huge delta system here. And also a big submarine uh, fan here. 
So this is all the fallen basin of the Himalayas. Uh, this is the Himalaya mountain range and this is the Tibetan plateau. So here you have a natural uh, sedimentary system, large scale. From source to sink. And that's a good example of, of, uh, of what, what's our problem, what's our question is when we are here at the mouth or in the delta, and let's say we have a core and we see stratigraphic cycles, we see sequences, we see changes. It doesn't have to be sequence or cycles, but just a change, let's say a progradation, deep, uh, shallowing upward succession. Our question is what, what it, it's a record of, of, of what? Is it a record of changing sea level? Is it a record of increased sediment supply? Is it a record of uh, increased precipitation and sediment supply? Is it uh, uh, maybe the activation of some trust in the mountain, in some drainage system here, creating more uplift, creating itself more sediment supply coming down? Or is it a climate driven sediment supply signal? Okay. So one observation here, because it's linked to a system which is interconnected and which has many ramifications and many different systems within itself, a single observation here can have multiple causes. Okay, It can be also internal dynamics of this. So that's, that's the question. Now, one way to address this is through the idea of um, response time, because that's an important um, that's an important uh, concept and constraint to address this issue. Because, for instance, if you have a signal taking place here, the question is whether it's big enough and long enough in terms of duration, such that it creates and it generates something here, OK? Just take an example. If you have a, a, an army of people bringing with trucks a couple of, of uh, sound trucks here, if you bring sound and sound here, you can imagine that this, this pile of sound that you put here is going to be smear, smeared. I don't know how you pronounce the, that, but it's going to be uh, étalé. It's going to be uh, smoothed out as it travels uh, downstream. OK? Uh, so the question is, when there is a tectonic um, event here, whether it's one earthquake or whether it's a cluster of earthquake during 40,000 years, does that create a signal that then is of sufficiently high magnitude and sufficiently long duration to be transmitted? And what controls whether the signal is going to be transmitted, at least partly, is the response time of the system. This, uh, the response time is, is a characteristic time in the system. Um, and so, for instance, um, uh, how could I um, explain this? Um, the system might be more or less efficient at transmitting signal. OK, if it has a long response time, then signals that, are, that take place over a shorter period than the characteristic response time of the system will not be transmitted or will be transmitted, but they will be altered. They will be buffered in, uh, in amplitude and they may be uh, offset in their uh, arrival. Okay. If, however, the perturbation, the signal is of the same or similar time scale as the response time, then this 
it will be transmitted. An analogy, for instance, if you take, um, let's say this is a, a one meter long stick of metal and somebody is holding the metal here on that side and somebody here as a lighter and uh, makes a flame. Okay, if you put the flame on, you're going to warm up the metal here. And the warmth, the heat is going to propagate along the along the metal stick. So the person at the other end will see a slow increase in temperature. And at some point, if the person here manages to keep the light on, the lighter on with the flame, at some point, the temperature will be the same all along. And the person here will feel the same temperature as the flame and will burn itself, himself or herself. OK. Next experiment. Again, one meter long stick of metal. And somebody here with a lighter does a flame for five seconds and then stop. Do you think the person here will stop will will feel will feel the, the heat? No, I think. No, it's not gonna transfer. Okay. It's not gonna be enough. If you just put your flame five seconds, it's not gonna be enough. That's even the case for your skin. If you pass the lighter on your skin, okay, you feel the warmth, but you don't burn yourself. Okay. If you if you leave the flame, of course you burn yourself. So don't do that. But so I think you see what I mean. There is a characteristic time for this one meter thick bar to transfer heat. And so if you do variation, let's say you you warm up, you you light the lighter, you put the lighter on, off, on, off. If you do it with a frequency, if you do it every five seconds, the person at the other end will not feel hot and cold and hot and cold, okay? But the person at the other end will, if you do that sufficiently long time on and off, the person at the other end will see a slow increase in temperature. And then it will be hot and maybe slightly varying, but much less than in the input. So here on this diagram, what you see is rapid forcing is when the time scale of the perturbation is much smaller than the equilibrium time of the bar. And here it's, it's in terms of water discharge and, and uh, sediment supply, but it's the same with heat. Okay. So you have light on and off, fire on, fire off, fire on, fire off every five seconds. And the bar has a 10 minute, let's say 10 minute trans transfer uh, response time. You will see at the other end, a slight increase. And then you will reach an equilibrium temperature, which is the average of on off, but you don't see the perturbations. Whereas if you keep the forcing long enough, then the response looks like the forcing when the time of the perturbation is bigger than the equilibrium time. Is that somehow uh, clear? Yes. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Now, one of the things that controls, that there's two things that control the response time of the metal stick. One is the, its length. Okay. If it's two meter long, it's going to take more time to transfer. You understand that? If it's zero, then uh, you burn yourself very quickly. And the other thing is it's, it's efficiency to transfer heat. It can be very efficient. It can be a very good heat uh, conveyor, or it can be very bad heat conveyor. If it's wood, then it's going to be for the same length. It's going to be much more time. OK, except it's going to burn maybe. So there is the efficiency to transmit and the length in this, in this 1D, uh, 1D metal bar. And so, 
So this is what we're going to see now. Uh, but in terms of sedimentary system, I just wanted to, to show you a little bit where, where things that you will see maybe in the literature, where do they come from? And so on this slide, I have one, two, and three to come to an expression of the response time, which is L square divided by K. And it's just what I just told you about. The response time is proportional to the length of the system square actually so it's very impacted by the length meaning the response time for a one for a two metal bar is going to be four times the response time for a one meter metal stick because of the square uh, exponent and that's divided by efficiency if the efficiency k is high then time is small the response time is small and so it's a reactive system. If K, the efficiency of the system, let's say wood instead of metal, is small, the conductivity of it, then the response time is long because you divide by a small number. So where, this, where does this come from, this expression, which is also very elegant and very simple and uh, very easy to manipulate? Um, it comes from studies of, well, Maybe it comes from, you know, often things come from different places uh, and different ideas. And so there are other ways to come to this. But one of the ways uh, I like to think about it is uh, studies on sediment transport on hill slopes. You remember what a hill slope is? It's what on the side, what is on the, on the side uh, of hills uh, and culling uh, in 1962, uh, published a paper, at least that's one of the ones I know of, where he explains that the flux of sediment coming out of such a, a slope um, is proportional to dz over dx. dz, so the variation of elevation over a certain distance how much z decreases for a certain x in other terms, that's slope, okay? So the flux of sediment is, it can be said equal to k, a certain constant times slope. For instance, you have a, you have a hill slope with a 30 degrees slope or let's say for a hundred, uh, for a um, ten percent or twenty percent slope, twenty meter per hundred meters. So you 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 go down twenty meter for every hundred meter in the horizontal direction. The flux of sediment is going to be k times the slope. Okay, in a, in such a in such a, a simplified system, and k is the efficiency or diffusivity of the system. It's the the ability of this slope, which works with a range of processes uh, that we don't detail here, but there is a range of processes that, that make it transfer sediment down with a certain efficiency, okay? And for instance, you can imagine what can act on diffusivity. You know, if this is just the slope, what could be in the diffusivity? In the diffusivity, you could have I mean, we imagine that a wet climate would increase sediment flux out of a hill slope. So K contains climate uh, to, in some ways. So it's a constant that embodies a lot of parameters. This QS proportional uh, to K times slope, this is a, an empirical equation. Empirical means it's derived from observation, okay? So, you know, this is not, um, it is not um, physics. It's not derived from first principles of physics. It's not expressing the physics of sediment transport because there is no gravity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's not a physical equation. 
It's an equation that describes what happens. And a lot of physical parameters, all of them actually, are into this scale. Um, because you can imagine how much comp how complicated are the physics of sediment transport on a hill slope. There is grass, there is weathering, transformation of rocks, minerals, uh, electric interactions between clay minerals holding the ground. There is uh, worms, uh, cows, um, there is sun, uh, you know, rainfall, rainfall intensity, duration, temperature, you name it, slope, uh, everything. So, so it's such a complex process, sediment transport on hill slopes, that everything is embodied into a constant, which is very practical and it's called uh, diffusivity. I guess it's a little bit the same when we think about heat diffusion, because uh, I guess the physics of um, heat transport must also be uh, very complicated at a molecular level. And so you can, you can think about them as embodied into some sort of, uh, of efficiency or diffusivity. Okay, so this is a first equation. The second equation is by thinking about topographic evolution. And I did a super simple uh, drawing here, which I hope is not too simple. But what, what you look at here is uh, the surface of the earth. Let's say, the, um, let's say we look at uh, the bottom of a river and we look at it on a distance of one meter. That's one meter wide. And we, it's just, uh, we don't see the water. There is just the surface of the, the bottom of the river, the riverbed. And there is some sediment coming in, like in the drawing of uh, the transfer system. There is a sediment, there is a certain amount of sediment coming in. And I could also look at how much sediment goes out of this area. If there is less sediment going out than in, there must have been sedimentation. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. If there is more sediment coming out than in, there must have been erosion. So basically, the budget between what's coming in and out, if I can look at this, I can know whether my river is in a state of sedimentation or degradation. Okay, and so whether the ground is going up or down and whether the ground is going up or down with time is dz over dt. Okay, so the, the variation in elevation with time. And so the difference between qs and qout on this interval is dq over dx because this is distance. Okay, z and x my reference frame. So I can write that the evolution of the surface with time is the derivative, the divergence of the sediment flux downstream with the distance. So that's my equation two, and this is my equation one. And you see that I have QS here and QS here. So dz over dt, I can express in terms of dqs over dx. So I, I replace, I put one, I put this, instead of QS. K is a constant, so it gets out. You remember that when you do a derivative, if there is a constant, it's out. And then I have dz over dx, and I, I derive dz over dx over dx. So I have d square z, d to z, dx square. Okay, this equation here is uh, I think what's called a partial uh, differential equation, which is used for, uh, that you can use to study the evolution with time of a topographic surface um, as a function of diffusivity, for instance. So people who do numerical modeling, they use this kind of equations to model landscape evolution, such as the one I showed you that yesterday with uh, the big vote on it, 
to do such a model, it consists in resolving such an equation at every grid, at every node on your, on your numerical grid. Now, something super interesting about this is that you can non-dimensionalize it. And this is what uh, Chris Paola has done in a paper in 1992. I guess maybe other people uh, before, but non-dimensionalizing is um, consists kind of in uh, attributing characteristic scales to these um, to these uh, members of the of the equation and and um, elements of the equation. So this is a sedimentary system: mountain transfer basin. And if I think about a sedimentary system and I, and I say, okay, my sedimentary system is governed by this diffusion equation. I have a characteristic height in my system. I could call it H, big H or big Z, but let's call it big H instead of small Z. This characteristic height, I don't know what it is, but it could be the height of the mountain. It could be the height from the bottom of the basin to the top of the mountain. It's just, uh, it's just something that is characteristic of the system. Okay. Think about a human. Uh, there are maybe several characteristic di dimensions in a human, but one of them is the size. If you're 1.6 meter high, you're quite different from someone who is two meter high. Okay. And so it's the same, a sedimentary system with a one kilometer average height is different from a system with a three or four kilometer height. Another characteristic is the length. If you look at a sedimentary system, which is two kilometer long, like from the top of the Salève to down to the Arve, or if you look at the Amazon system, which is 6,000 kilometers long, it's not the same system. So length is the characteristic, length is characteristic of the system. And then there is a characteristic time, which could be the characteristic equilibrium time for the system to reach equilibrium, like the characteristic time for the metal bar to transmit perturbations. And so what you do to non-dimensionalize this is you replace this term by big H, dt by big T, k is out. D2Z is you derive twice H, so you just have a big H. However, DX2 is DX DX, so it's L times L, so it's L squared. And you see that H eliminates itself from the equation, and we are, we are left with 1 over T equals K, 1 over L squared, which is T equals L squared divided by K, the diffusivity. Okay, so equilibrium time of a system governed by this kind of diffusion, the equilibrium time is equal to L squared divided by K. So coming back to this, the equilibrium time of the metal bar will be four times more if it's twice times longer and will be proportional to the conductivity of heat in the metal bar, okay? Superconductor, for instance, have a very high uh, diffusivity such that the time scale, so a very high efficiency such that the time scale is, uh, is uh, almost zero. In a superconductor, you will light, you will have a one kilometer long bar, you will put your lighter here and the other person at the other end will feel the, the heat instantly. I don't think this exists for heat. Maybe I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know these things at all, but, but uh, for electricity or, or things like that, it, it works. Is this okay? Yes. Okay. So um, we have uh, six minutes left uh, because I must go also at the end. So I just want to introduce this and I think I will, uh, I will send you a, a video of the rest um, afterwards, if you like. Okay. Um, so here, um, 
I wanted to show, I, I will show in the rest several examples, okay, uh, of how to apply this to mountain ranges and uh, sedimentary basins and, and landscape in general. And so one example here is the example of the growth of topography. So here I'm, I'm representing a, a mountain range. Okay, there is no scale, but let's say this is two kilometers high. And there is two sides. Let's say it's the Alps. Uh, it's a symmetrical mountain range for the sake of the, the thought experiment. And there is convergence, these arrows. And there is uplift in black, everywhere the same. And there is erosion in green. So here I am at steady state. Erosion and uplift are equal. And I converge, I converge, but the relief remains the same. Okay. Now, at some point, for some reason, my convergence rate increases. You see the arrows, they are bigger. This will increase tectonic uplift. When this happens, my mountain will grow until because, because why does it grow my, my mountain? It wouldn't grow if erosion rate would instantly balance my change of uplift. If I would go from, from, from a small uplift of one millimeter to let's say two millimeter per year and erosion would instantly change, then I would remain with this shape, okay? But it doesn't happen. Normally, there is a certain time before erosion catches up with the new rock uplift. Okay. And in this time, the mountain can go. That's what you see here. This is elevation, uh, but there is also uplift. Okay. The, the elevation is in blue. And I didn't make a line, but something. Let's say it's, it changes a little bit with time. But here, the elevation is in equilibrium, is stable, is in equilibrium with steady state, with uplift. And here, I multiply uplift by two. During a period of growth, my erosion is smaller than my uplift. And so I will grow topography because I, I, I uplift more than I erode. But at some point, erosion becomes now um, capable enough to balance my tectonic uplift and I reach a new steady state. Okay, this is time and this is elevation and rock uplift in that, on that uh, axis. So there is a certain time before I reach the new steady state and this is governed by the equilibrium time of my system. And it could be, uh, it could be uh, a, something similar to the, the T egg that I showed you in the previous uh, slide. The question is, how much is it in real mountains? And because this has an importance, if you look in, this, in, the, in the sedimentary basin and you are in the, in the Gange Delta, you know, if this is very long, uh, you are going to, you need that to know when the change in tectonics happen and what was its scale of change. Okay, but this is the signal and this is the response in blue. So, so this is important because, uh, because this is what controls what you read uh, in your end product, which is your sedimentary succession. So I have modeling papers to show you uh, next uh, because that's a tectonic change, but there could be also a climatic change. But I wanted to show you uh, something that we have done. And let me just uh, quickly add that this is the work of uh, Louis Honegger. Louis Honegger. In it's in preparation, but Louis defended his PhD uh just recently i think on the 15th 15th of may 2020 and 
what we uh, studied is the topographic evolution of the Pyrenees. And it didn't work out everything, but the topographic evolution is, is this line here and then increasing and then standing there and then increasing again. This was worked by uh, Maggie Curry, which is who is now uh, in Texas. And she did a flexural model in 2009, uh, the, like the one I showed you before, you know, flexure in front of a mountain. And thanks to the flexure, she was able to reconstruct the topographic load, okay? And how the load has had changed with time to explain the flexure we observe in the basin. And she showed that from the middle Eocene on, or the late Eocene on, towards the Oligocene, there is a strong increase in topography. And then it's kind of reaching a maximum here in the Pyrenees, which is about 3.5 thousand meter elevation. And since then, in the last 25 million years, it's been decreasing, but you see very slowly. What we know is that in the beginning of the, in the end of the Cretaceous, we had the initiation of the mountain range. Okay, so that's, that's with the onset of convergence. Uh, there was a rifting before, and then there is inversion of the rift, and there is initial topographic development. And what Louis was able to show by using a very big compilation of oxygen isotopes in the fallen basin, he could show that the local isotopic signal deviates strongly from the global signal of the early Eocene. So in the early Eocene, you go towards uh, more and more uh, de uh, small delta O18, if I'm not wrong. And uh, delta O18, you go, you go towards negative delta O18 here. And what, what uh, Louis could show is that here in the Pyrenees, you go much faster towards negative values. And this can be explained by the growth of topography. So what we have here is we can show that the Pyrenees grew slowly here in the late Cretaceous and Paleocene, even with perhaps a period of even quiescence, tranquility in the Paleocene. And then somewhere here, whether it's 54 or 56, we don't know, but somewhere here, there is a strong increase in growth, in topographic growth. So the mountain range grows to an elevation of about two kilometers. And then, uh, thanks to data by Damien Huig, uh, who studied mollusks, oyster shells, and, and uh, the likes in the Fallen Basin, and compared that with the isotopic signal in the Paris Basin, by comparison of the signals, he could show that the, uh, the elevation of the range remained at about this uh, from, from our death data and his data, it shows that the elevation of the range remained at about two kilometer high during uh, from 50 to about 39 or, or 38 million years. So almost 10 million years of no change in elevation. And then there was another change that, that was demonstrated by Maggie Curry. So the range grows by periods of slow growth, rapid growth, steady state, rapid growth, and another kind of steady state, and then decline. Okay, so it's quite interesting to think about that. And this matches very well thermochronometric data. These three bumps here are free. They have no quantitative meaning into them, except the age, the peak age, the center of the bump is the age of maximum exhumation, okay? And so from thermochronometric data, Amy Wichert was able to show that there is a first pulse of exhumation, erosion and tectonics here at about 78 million years. There's another pulse here where we see the topographic growth. And there's another pulse here, just where Maggie Curry sees the topographic growth, okay? And our another data set is the set of convergence rate and shortening rate. And what we see is that the convergence rate changed abruptly somewhere at 56. And we have the growth of the mountain there. 
But you see that we are in a situation quite similar to this, that the change in convergence rate is also very strong, very sharp, but the topographic response is smoothed. And it takes several million years, we don't know exactly how much, but two, five, seven, for the mountain range to reach steady state and to be in equilibrium with the new conditions of convergence rate. So it's quite an important data to know that this mountain responded to tectonic changes on a time scale of several million years. <laughs>